boxes with such excitement. Some of them is the very first time that they ever received a gift in their lives. Jesus loves you. That's what Operation Christmas Child is all about, is to reach children of the world with God's love. And we do that through a simple gift. There's no greater joy than knowing we're getting to be a part of the Great Commission together. There's no way that you could do this without volunteers. They're incredible. The energy that they have, the excitement that they have. This is the good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. When we pray, God takes your gift and he begins to navigate around the world and it ends up in the hands of a child. God begins to answer those prayers. After a child receives a gift box, the child is invited to go through the greatest journey. They know the story of God and they can tell others by using the books. These boxes can be used as a tool to touch a whole community. The Great Commission, we're to go into all the world to preach the God, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. That's what we do. It never ceases to amaze me how a simple box can change the world for a child. Okay, so I know what you've been thinking this whole time. I've been sitting all morning. I need to stand. That was your opportunity, all right? So here we go. Let's all stand and honor our Lord to our feet. Let's sing together this morning. We're going to start with Are You Wise? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour?
Starting in verse 14. Let us pick up 13. It says, So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God is come. And then he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question amongst themselves which of them it was who would do these things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we look at your word, Lord, and the revelation of the betrayal at the Passover supper. We ask, Lord, that we might look at our own hearts before we take the Lord's Supper and examine who we are and what our relationship is with you and how we have at times betrayed. Father, we just ask that you would speak to us through your word today. Bless it. Let it be glorified as it goes forth for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you read this passage, you probably noticed some of the things a little different than you've read in other passages of the Bible concerning the Passover. In Matthew and Mark, we see a difference as to when Judas left the Passover meal. We also see a difference in the way that the host is presented. The reason being is that Dr. Luke got his gospel from a variety of sources. Some from Peter, some from probably James and John, some from others who were disciples, maybe not of the twelve, who related the story to him, and he doesn't necessarily put it in chronological order. So don't get upset if you see a little variation here. He's telling the story of the event. He may not have it correct in its chronological order that things were done, but the event was related to him by others. Luke wasn't there. So don't get upset if you see this as a, as a dispersing uh, passage in the Bible that should cause us doubt. No. Luke was just simply saying, folks, this is the event that took place. This is what happened, and this is what we need to look at. First of all, I want us to look at the promise that's given us in verses 14 through 16. Notice that he says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What he's saying to them is this. Fellas, I'm eating the Passover with you. It's going to be my last one. My time has come. I'm going to be crucified shortly after this. I'm not going to be here. 
But I want you to know I've reserved a supper that I'm going to have with all those that believe with me in the kingdom. I will eat it again with all of the believers and with you included. It's a promise of the future. It's a promise that he gave them to give them encouragement. And we should always take encouragement from his words because he never breaks a promise. I believe that one day we're going to have that supper with him in heaven. The Bible tells us that. That supper is going to be for the believers. Those that have believed in Jesus Christ and trusted him. All of those from the time that he died on the cross and resurrected from the grave until the time that he takes us home. Either by death or through the rapture. We're going to have a supper with the Lord. Now, to that is, that ought to mean something. Some white people are kind of kidding around saying, well, I figured the Baptists would all bring potluck with them when they come for the supper. <laughs> you know, that's typical for us Baptists. That's okay. I just know that when we get there, it's going to be like when he was out there on the seashore uh, the last time that he talked with the disciples and they were fishing and couldn't. He's going to have the meal already prepared. He's going to have the bread prepared. He's going to have the fish prepared. But have a white fish. Don't worry about it. It'll taste like steak, okay? You'll have it prepared. You'll have it so that we like it. So the promise is given right here. I'm going to eat this again with you, and it's going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then it says he takes and does what is we have traditionally called the communion, the Passover. We have to understand that this is in connection with what the Jewish people were doing in the Passover. And when you read this, you see that he doesn't just simply take a little cup like we normally do. He took a pitcher of wine or a bottle of wine and he passed it around. Now, I'm not going to get into the argument whether or not it was fermented or not. I kind of think it's probably the first fruits of the grape. Because that's usually what was served a lot, at, uh, especially if there were going to be children present, they would get, give grape juice out. But the word wine does come in seven different ideas and, and uh, descriptions. But the wine that was given to children was diluted about four or five times with water. If there was any alcoholic content, and it was very little at that point in time. So I'm not going to debate you as to whether it ought to be uh, fermented or unfermented wine. I will tell you that we have to be careful about how long we leave it in the refrigerator. Oh, yes. Because there was a time when we did have, not here, but in one of the churches that I pastored, that we did have a little spicy wine <laughs> when it came time for the Lord's Supper because the deacons didn't check out when it was bought or how long it had set in there. And it had a wine to it, folks, every day. <laughs> I called him later on that day and I said, are any of you guys drunk? <laughs> the host is to represent something. The bread represents his body. It represented that he willingly placed himself in the path of death. He didn't move when they started driving those nails. He stretched both arms out willingly. He didn't fight them. He put both his feet together willingly. Now, folks, I don't know about you. I've never had a spike driven through me, but I've had a needle run through my finger, and I've had a, a saw cut my, my, my thumb. And all of that is painful. I can't even imagine what it was like to have a spike nail run through my body. But Jesus did. And he did it for one purpose. That the body that was given to him by the Lord, which was one that would deteriorate if he lived long enough because it was a body just like ours. But he gave that body to die. We have to remember that that was a real human body, not a human-like body. It was a real human body. And when he died on the cross, he truly died a death as we would die. He gave his body for us. 
the wine or the grape juice or whatever we use. I know I was teaching some young children about it one time. And I had them all sit on the front row, maybe we ought to do this with them. And I had those little fish crackers. And instead of giving them the host from that, I'd give them a little fish cracker and I explained to them what it was all about. And I gave them a great Kool-Aid and told them this is what it represented. So that they would understand that when it come time for them to accept Jesus, that this is one of the things that we do to remember what he did on the cross. The grape juice or the wine or whatever is used is representative of the blood. Now, I want you to know something. We don't drink blood. And it doesn't become blood when we take it in. Neither does the body, the bread, become of the body. It is symbolic of what Jesus did. He introduced this method right here. Because this was a method that the Jews used to remember what was done for them back in Genesis. Or uh, getting ready to prepare for the Exodus, excuse me. And if you look at that, you go back and look at how that happened. The Passover was initiated. It was during the plagues that was brought upon the Egyptian people because of their refusal to let the, the uh, uh, Hebrews go. And it was labeled, each house was labeled as to who was Jewish and who was not. There was blood that was placed upon either side post of the door. And then there was placed upon the mantle. And then as the blood dripped down, it stained the doorstep. And if you look at that real carefully, my friends, that makes the pattern of the cross. It foretold what was going to happen even before it happened. It foretold that we would be saved by the blood shedding of Jesus Christ. And that his blood would be the sacrifice that would cover our sins. Take them away, not just cover them, but abolish them. One of the things that people have a difficulty with is accepting their forgiveness. I don't know how many people I've talked to say, you know, you don't know what I've done. Let me tell you something. Jesus does he knows every sin you've committed. And he says to you that if thou shalt believe on me, you shall be saved. And your sins will be forgiven. And I like the word that is used there because it represents what he did on the cross. At the cross, as he died, he said, Teta telestai. It is finished. That's an accounting word. It means that the Bill is paid in full. The debt is paid. That means that when his blood ran out of his body, he was paying for our sins. And we no longer have to worry about a, a, an accounting sheet there that God will hold up in front of us and say, uh, here's your sins. We will not be at the great white throne judgment. I don't care what somebody else has told you. The only reason we may be there is spectators. Because once you're forgiven, you're forgiven. God has done it all. And we don't have to worry any longer. It also says that as he gave this, he told them that I'll not drink of this wine, nor of the part of taking of this bread until the kingdom comes. Until you're with me. So we're going to have a communion supper with the Lord. And we're going to have a remembrance time. By the way, that's what communion means. It's a remembrance. And he goes on to tell us that when we take this, we need to do this in remembrance of him. Notice what's written, written up there. Of course, you can't see it because of the covers. But on the uh, communion table, in remembrance of Christ, of me. In my remembrance. It always says those that on the communion tables. It's not for our remembrance of ourselves. It's for our remembrance of what Jesus did for us. That's what the communion is all about. Well, what about this prevaricator? 
that we find in the last verses. They said that likewise he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament covenant in my blood, which is shed. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. I went to the thesaurus. Yeah, I got some young people to hear you. You know what a thesaurus is? That's where you look up words that have another meaning for the same word you're trying to write down, okay? The dictionary. They see those a lot on computers now, but I've got the actual handheld originals in my office that you guys ever want to come to school. <laughs> they date back a few years, too. Let me tell you. Here's what it says about betray. Get it up here closer enough where I can read it. I copied it out of there today. To betray means to deliver into the hands of an enemy. To play false. To break faith or trust. To inform or on or against. To commit high treason. To turn informer. To delude. Break one's promise. Be false hearted. Go over to the enemy or to trick, to sail down the river, to let go, to play Judas, to give the Judas kiss, to double cross, to deliver up, to sell out, to stab in the back, to bite the hand that is feeding you, to blow the path, to cross up, to turn state's evidence. The term for betrayer is this, renegade, deceiver, conspirator. You know, we point a lot to what Jesus did. But in giving you the definition there of betrayal, the is there not some time in our life we've done the same thing? Is there not some time in which we have betrayed Christ or someone else? Are we not just as guilty as Judas? We always point to Judas for Jesus' death. Folks, I want you to know it was our sins that brought Jesus to his death. It wasn't just the action of one person. That was the part of God's plan as to how they would play out. But it was not the action of one person that brought Jesus to the cross. It's the action of every person who lived upon the earth from that point on. From the beginning of time until now. It was the sin of all of us who betrayed Jesus. That brought him to the cross. That's why he wanted his disciples to remember the Passover with him. He said that he desired fervently that they should remember this. That they would keep it in mind. And it has passed down from generation to generation, century to century, until today, that the church still remembers what Jesus did on the cross. That's how important it was for him to remember. If we have betrayed him, unlike Judas, who did not go back and seek forgiveness, we have the privilege and opportunity of doing that. To seek forgiveness for our sins. To admit that we're wrong in God's right. To ask Christ to forgive us and to believe that he was actually born of a virgin, that he was a real man, that he died a real death, that he buried and resurrected again, and that he's coming back to believe those things about him. That's what it means to confess him. Then to confess also and repent of going the direction we're going. And start to follow him as he leads us through the power of the Holy Spirit, which becomes part of our life. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to have your sins forgiven. That's what it means to remember who Jesus is.
It's more than just this ceremony. It's something that must be remembered day by day by day. It should never leave our thoughts. It should always be there that Jesus died for us and our sins are forgiven. Today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And as we do so, before we do so, I want to give a hymn of invitation. If you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to come and accept Him and be part of that service.